Well, good morning, everybody. So good to see you here and to know there's also a bunch of you that are joining us online this morning. We are glad that you are a part of what's happening today as we launch this new series called For the Sake of the World. In his book, The Great Good Place, sociologist Ray Oldenburg introduced this concept that he called the third place. Now, what Oldenburg says there is that there is what we might call our first place, that is our home, the place that we live and uh, whether we live with family there, we live with roommates, that's, that's kind of our, our first place. We spend a lot of our time in that first place. And the thing about the first place is it's usually high in relationship, but, but relatively low in diversity. In other words, people that we're there with, we're in strong relationship, but they're people that are like us, that, that generally believe the kinds of things that, that we do. That's our first place. Then you have our second place, that is um, our work, or if you're a student, your, your school. It's the place that you show up every day, and it's just a part of your life. You spend a lot of time in that second place, and that second place is often high in diversity. There's people there that are very different than us, but, but typically speaking, sort of low in relationship. That is, we're not there primarily for relationship. We're, we're there primarily to, to get a job done. So your first place, the place where you live, your, your second place, that place where you work, and then there is that third place. That place that you show up, that's regularly a part of your life, a place that you can begin to build some relationships. So it has the potential to be high in relationship and high in diversity. You show up there with people who are different than you, and you show up there because sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, and they're always glad that you came. And some of you are chuckling, some of you have no idea why there's people chuckling, right? That's a reference to the theme song from the show Cheers. And Cheers is a great example of a third place. It's just one of those places that the, the people that were a part of that showed up regularly and they were in relationship. Norm would walk in and everybody goes, Norm, right? We're always glad that you're here. Um, if Cheers is a little bit not your generation, maybe for my Gen X friends in the room, it's, uh, it's Central Perk, right? In the TV show Friends, that coffee shop that they kind of uh, order their lives and the, the, the show is sort of built around. For, for um, my millennial friends in the room, it's the bar from How I Met Your Mother, right? Where they just, they show up very regularly in relationship. For those of you who are the Gen Z generation, because even that show is How I Met Your Mother been off the air for a few years now. I'm, I'm sure there is an example for you, for Gen Z. I'm just too old and out of touch to know what it is, right? So you can come afterwards and tell me what the example is for your generation. But it's that idea of a place that we show up regularly. It's just part of our lives for you. It might be PTA or your gym or, or Little League or, or maybe it's a pub or a coffee shop, right? Starbucks actually began with a corporate philosophy that was all built around this idea of the third place, recognizing that it was something that was missing in the lives of many Americans. And so when Starbucks began, they weren't really selling $4 lattes so much as they were selling this idea of a third place. When they first got started, they would never have a drive through right? Some of you remember, there, there was no drive through at any Starbucks for a long time because that was completely antithetical to the whole idea of the third place. The thing is, they got us all hooked on $4 lattes. They put in a drive-thru and they made a killing, right? This idea of the third place. These are the spaces, these are the places where we spend our lives. Our first place, our, our home, our neighborhood, our, our, our second place, our, our workplace, our school, or our third place. Those places that we show up and we begin to make connections. What I wanna talk about today is how we live out the mission of God in the midst of those ordinary spaces of our lives, our homes, our neighborhoods, our our workplaces and schools, our third places in life. Because we as followers of Jesus are called to live out the mission of God in each of those spaces. We are called to live our ordinary lives with a kind of missional intentionality. And that word missional, it's, it's sort of a church word, but, but, but you can think about it this way. It's very simple. It's just taking the noun mission and turning it into an adjective. So you can think of it like an old SAT analogy. A mission is to missional as fiction is to fictional, right? Mission is to missional as fiction is to fi- fictional. That is, to call something fictional is just to say at the core of the essence of what this thing is, it's a work of fiction, To to talk about something as missional is to say at the core, at the essence of what this thing is, is this idea of mission. 
And I believe the God of the Bible is a missional God. The core of who God is is his mission to rescue and renew his good but broken creation. I believe the Bible is a missional story. It is one story, start to finish, that's all about the mission of God to rescue and renew his good but broken creation. I believe that every church, and certainly our church, ought to be a missional church at the core, at the essence of who we are is this idea of our participation in the mission of God. And I believe that discipleship, for each of us individually, right? It's one thing to talk about us being missional collectively, corporately, but for each of us individually, our discipleship is to be missional discipleship. Now, I know that for me to talk about that may feel, for some of us, like adding something else onto our already over-busy, overburdened lives, I don't know if there's anybody that can relate to the idea that we live over busy, overburdened lives. And so for you to hear me say we're to to live the mission of God in these ordinary spaces of our lives feels like adding something else on top of everything else that already demands my time and attention. But I actually want us to think differently about it. I want us to think about what it means to live with missional intentionality in our ordinary lives, not as adding something else on but having that kind of missional intentionality in the midst of what we already do. And I want us to talk about what that looks like this morning. We're beginning a new series called For the Sake of the World that that we say around here a lot, that that God is calling us, the people of Irving Bible Church, to become a multi-ethnic movement of missionary disciples formed in the way of Jesus for the sake of the world. God is calling us to become a multi-ethnic movement. We, We find ourselves in the midst of an incredibly diverse city, filled with people from all kinds of backgrounds, cultures, ethnicities. And and God is calling us to be faithful to this time in this place, recognizing that this passion for the nations is at the heart of the biblical story from start to finish. So he's calling us to be a multi-ethnic movement, but a movement of missionary disciples that, that, that we live on mission, formed in the way of Jesus for the sake of the world. And if you've been around all year, you know that back at the beginning of the year, we said, we wanna go this year, we wanna go deeper in our discipleship to Jesus by going deeper into the biblical story. And we've done that in several ways. We've shaped our sermon series throughout the course of the year by this big story of the Bible. In addition to that, we've been doing daily readings through the New Testament where we're reading a chapter a day every weekday. And over the course of this year, we'll go from Matthew to Revelation. We've also then done a number of initiatives in each of our ministries designed to help take people deeper into the story of the Bible. But as we talked about this idea of the story of the Bible, we said it follows a a traditional kind of uh, narrative arc. It begins with an introduction that establishes the setting to the story. And then we have conflict that enters in, the conflict of sin that enters the story of God's good creation. We have the rising action that is the Old Testament story, the people of Israel, the people who are supposed to be part of the solution, but that demonstrated themselves to continue to be part of the problem until we ultimately get to the climax of the story in the life and work of Jesus. And then from the climax of the story, the next movement is what's called the descending action. That is the unfolding of the consequences of the climax. And this series really follows that descending action, that is Jesus sending the church into the world on the mission of God. And we begin to see the, 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 the descending action of the biblical story in the book of Acts. And so if you have your Bible or you have it on your device, turn with me to Acts chapter one. Acts chapter one, we see the consequences of the, the climax, the life and ministry of Jesus begin to unfold. And, and we particularly wanna look this morning at Acts 1 and Jesus' final words to his disciples. Now in this scene, Jesus is gathered with his disciples on the Mount of Olives just outside of Jerusalem. And I have to imagine that their lives at this point feel very disoriented, right? They followed Jesus faithfully for three years. They had invested all their hope in him being Israel's Messiah, the one who would be the liberating king. And then he was arrested And he was killed. He was violently executed on a cross. And all of their hopes came crashing down. (laughs) 
and then he showed up again. He's alive. He's back. The resurrection. They believed that Jesus had come to be their liberator from the, the lowercase t tyrant of Rome. And in fact, he showed himself to be the one who'd come to, to overcome the capital T tyrant of sin and death. And he demonstrates that through his resurrection. And so he's there. And then he's gone again. And he's there. And he's gone again. And he's there, and, and, and I have to think that those 40 days in which Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection were a very disorienting kind of time for them. And so they, they finally come to him. They're gathered there on the Mount of Olives, and, and, and they say in verse 6, they gathered around him, and they asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of, to Israel? Right? This is now gonna, you're going to do what we thought you were going to do from the beginning. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, it's interesting to note that when Jesus speaks to them about the coming of the Holy Spirit, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And sometimes, in some traditions, the, the emphasis is so much on the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And, and there's some of us that could use a little bit more of that, a little bit more of an emphasis on the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. But what I want you to note is in this verse, as Jesus is giving these last words to his disciples before he ascends into heaven, he, he tells them, here's the whole point of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, and that is that you would be my witnesses. The empowerment of the Spirit is empowerment to live the mission of God. I, I love the way that N.T. Wright puts this in his book, Simply Christian. Here's what he says. He says, despite what you might think from some excitement in previous generations about new spiritual experiences, God doesn't give people the Holy Spirit in order to let them enjoy the spiritual equivalent of a day at Disneyland. Of course, if you're downcast and gloomy, the fresh wind of God's spirit can and often does give you a new perspective on everything and above all, grants a sense of God's presence, love, comfort, and even joy. But the point of the spirit is to enable those who follow Jesus to take into all the world the news that he is Lord, that he has won the victory over the forces of evil, that a new world has opened up and that we are to help make it happen. The, the point of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit is to empower God's people for mission. And he says to them, note, note this, he says to them, and you will be my witnesses. I think it's really important that we notice what he doesn't say. He, he doesn't say, you might be my witnesses. Right? He doesn't say, I, I'd really like for you to be my witnesses. He, he doesn't say, please, please be my witnesses. No, what does he say? He says, you will be my witnesses. And so if, if we're here this morning, we're followers of Jesus, we will be his witnesses. The issue isn't will we or won't we, it's what kind of witnesses will we be? Will we be good witnesses? Will we be faithful witnesses? And friends, I gotta tell you, I worry about the church in North America in recent years that in many ways we suffer from a kind of credibility crisis. And so often I think that is the case because we've elevated other things higher than our commitment to the mission of God. We've been preoccupied with other things other than a preoccupation with living as faithful witnesses to the way of Jesus. And to bear witness is simply to, to, to live our lives and to use our words in ways that point people to the truth that we have encountered in Christ. We bear witness when we show up for people, when we love people, when we serve people, when, when we extend compassion and comfort and hope to our neighbors around us, when we move toward those broken places in the world, when, when we seek to, to bind people's wounds, when we seek to advocate for justice, as we seek to move towards the broken places of the world around us, to love people, to serve people, to live our lives dedicated to the way of Jesus for the sake of the world. That's what it means to be faithful witnesses. 
Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. And he says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That, that Jesus gives these kind of expanding circles of concern. And that's gonna give shape to our series over these four weeks. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. But it begins where it always has to begin. And that is right where we are. Whatever it is that you want to accomplish in life, whatever you wanna see done in the world, the only place that you can begin is to begin where you are. And that's what Jesus says to his disciples here. You gotta begin where you are. You gotta begin right here in Jerusalem. And so for us, our Jerusalem is just to think about the people in the places that we encounter every day of our lives right where we are. Our first place, our second place, our third places. And what does it mean for us to live as witnesses in those places? Well, I think we have a very important perspective offered to us by the Apostle Paul. If you have your Bible, you can flip over with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter two. Because Paul, there's a line here in 1 Thessalonians. Paul is writing to this, to this church, this group of people in the city of Thessalonica to talk about the kind of life that he lived among them as he sought to bear witness to Jesus in their midst. This city of Thessalonica that, that didn't know the gospel, that, that didn't know Jesus, and here's the way that Paul talks about how he and his companions showed up. In the middle of verse seven, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter two. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Right, isn't that beautiful? He begins with this just tender metaphor. Like a nursing mother with her child. So we cared for you. And then he says, and, and we loved you enough. We loved you so much, not only to share the gospel of God with you, but our lives as well. I think sometimes we get the mistaken impression that witness is primarily about words. And we're gonna talk about the importance of, of, of words as we move forward, but I think we have to begin just by recognizing here that the power of their witness was not just their words, but their lives. We loved you enough not only to share the gospel of God with you, but our lives as well. Now, I, I want everybody here to think about a, a, a person. If you are a follower of Jesus in the room, I want you to think about the person who played the most definitive most significant role in your decision to, to trust and follow Jesus, All right? Many of us have stories where you could point to a number of people who are very influential on that um, commitment to trust and to follow Jesus. But, but I want you to think about who would you say had the most kind of impact on you trusting and following Jesus? I want everybody to get a, a, a face, a name in your mind, right? Everybody got somebody you're thinking of? Right, this is the interactive portion of the sermon. This means yes, right? Now, I wonder how many of you that for that person that you're thinking of, this sentiment was true, right? How many of you could say about that person, they loved me enough not only to share the gospel of God with me, but their lives as well, right? How many could say that that person that played that definitive role in my coming to trust and follow Jesus not only shared words, but invested their life in me. If that's true of that person you're thinking of, would you just raise your hand up real high so we can see all the way around the room? Everybody raise your hand real high. Look at that. Look at that. Look around the room. Notice, I mean, and, and I've done this many times through the years with students, and every time, the vast majority of us, the person that played the most significant role in coming to faith was someone who lived this sentiment. We loved you enough not only to share the gospel of God with you, but our lives as well. And here's what you have to recognize, friends. Every one of you has the opportunity to be that person in the life of someone else. I wanna tell you about my friend Peter. We'll call him Peter, good biblical name, right? 
Uh, Peter grew up uh, going to a, a Presbyterian church. His, his mom took him to church. He was a part of Sunday school, but, but his dad really wasn't a part of church. And, and while he was there, he heard things of God. He, he really never established any kind of relationship with God. He, he really never came to that place where he, he trusted in Jesus. So, so he had exposure to Christianity. He had exposure to faith as a child, and yet by the time he got into his teenage and then his young adult years, he'd, he'd moved far away from that. He began to make some choices in his life that led him into cycles of, of shame and, and substance abuse. Then he reached for alcohol and for uh, drugs to try to, to try to just numb his life. I've heard him talk about the fact that, that he looks back and while he felt himself very far from God at that time, that he can recognize that God kept him alive in the midst of some choices in his life that, that easily could have led to his own death. And he lived for years kind of in that place and then finished college and began a career. He started a family. He eventually not only was married but had three young children and, and was kind of living that corporate life. And, and there was some sense that he felt that something was missing in his life. And he had Christian friends that, that tried to talk to him about faith and that, that were committed to pray for him. There was something in there that was intriguing to him and yet he really didn't, he didn't give himself over to, to pursue it until there were a couple of neighbors that began to just invest their life in his. A couple of neighbors that began to, to just love him and his wife really well. A couple of IBCers, Dwight and Sharon. And, uh, and they just began to, to love and to serve and to, to share meals with and share life with Peter and his wife. Um, in time, she, the wife, became interested in what was happening with our women's Bible study. And so Sharon would babysit their three young children so that she could go and attend women's Bible study and, and, and she could go and experience profound healing in her own life through counseling. Peter began to connect more and more with Dwight. They would play golf together and, and, um, and, and Dwight just was investing his life in Peter's. In time, uh, Dwight and, and Sharon introduced them to Steve and Jackie, another couple that were neighbors of theirs and who were a part of IBC. They were on staff at the time. And Steve and Jackie began to invest their lives in the life of Peter and his wife. Uh, he, he talks about the one Saturday, he looks up and, and Steve's out there just mowing his yard. And in time, there's something about the way in which those friends loved them enough not only to share the gospel of God with them, but their lives as well, that drew them into the life of this church and drew them in to the life of faith. And they determined to trust and follow Jesus. And that's the story of my friend Pete and his wife Mary Heinemann. That story was from a little over 20 years ago. And today... Pete is the chairman of our elder board because some friends, yes, yes, God in his faithfulness, because some friends showed up and loved them enough not only to share the gospel of God with them, but their lives as well. I mean, what an impact that it has made on, on the life of Pete and Mary and their kids, their family, but also on the life of this church, on, on my life. And you, my friends, have the opportunity to be that in the lives of of other people. And I wanna spend the last few minutes that we have together just talking very practically about what that might look like, what, what it might look like practically to live ordinary life with the kind of missional intentionality in, in your first place, in your second place, in your third place. And to do that, we have a little acronym that we use in our formation groups called BLESS. Some of you have heard this and it's just a good opportunity to get a refresher on it. BLESS, it's an acronym, B-L-E-S-S, -S, and I'm gonna introduce it to you and then I'm gonna walk you through each one of them. Bless, begin with prayer. L, listen to the needs of others. E, eat with others. I especially like that one. S, serve others. And then the final S, share your story. Right? Begin with prayer. Listen to the needs of others. Eat with others. Serve others. Share your story. Let's start with B. Begin with prayer. It is remarkable what God will do if you'll just ask him to bring people into your path. If you will dedicate yourself to praying for people who are in your life, 
and pray for him to open doors for opportunity. Paul has some really interesting words. In my Bible, it's actually just across the page from what we read in 1 Thessalonians. Back in Colossians chapter four, in this final chapter, Paul is, is asking them for prayer. He says this in Colossians four, beginning of verse two. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, that is Paul asking for prayer for himself and his companion. Pray, pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. And pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Now, I want you to just note this. Paul is asking for prayer, and, and he says that God may open a door for our message about the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. And when Paul says for which I am in chains, he is not speaking metaphorically. Right? When Paul writes this, he is literally in chains. He's in prison. And I'm telling you, I know exactly what I would be asking for prayer for if I was in chains, right? Get me out of here. And that's not what he asks for prayer for. He says, pray that God would open a door for our message. Because Paul recognizes that, that there's sometimes, there's some ways in which if we try to just bust a door open, we might actually push people away from the gospel. Pray that God would open a door for our message and that I would proclaim it clearly as I should. It's a pretty good prayer, huh? That we would seek to live ordinary lives with missional intentionality that begins with praying, God, open a door and help me to share. God, open a door, help me to share. Begin with prayer. Second, listen to the needs of others. We often think about bearing witness as the words that we say to other people, and yet I believe, especially more and more in the kind of world that we live in today, that when it comes to bearing witness, we need to do a lot less talking and a lot more listening. And that our posture of listening to others actually opens up the opportunity for us to be able to talk. But, but, but what sometimes happens is our talking actually gets in the way of our really listening. And there is a deep longing in every human soul to really feel heard. In his fantastic little book, The Listening Life, Adam McHugh says it this way. He says, loneliness drives us to talk about ourselves in excess and turns conversations toward ourselves. It makes us grasp onto others thinking their role is to meet our needs. And it shrinks the space that we have in our souls for welcoming others in. That loneliness would keep us from listening and others from listening to us is a tragedy because being listened to is one of the great assurances in this universe that we are not alone. Part of bearing witness is our willingness to show up and listen, really listen to the needs of others. Begin with prayer. God, open a door, help me to share. Listen deeply to the needs of others. Third, eat with others. That's just this recognition that, that your table could be, has the potential to be one of the most significant missional places in your entire life. And I'll tell you, Kim and I used to be a lot better about this, about having people in our home and, and sharing tables with people. Before COVID, that was like a part of our lives. And since then, it, it, it sort of has fallen out of something that we put any real time and attention into. This just challenges me to say, we, we gotta get better at this. But, but it doesn't even have to be your table, right? In, in theory, all of us have 21 meals over the course of a week. Right? Unless you're a hobbit and you have second breakfast, then you have 28. Right? So when you skip breakfast, you, but you get the idea. Right? 21 meals over the course of a week. What if, what if we were just, what, what might happen if you just were intentional to say, one of those meals, I'm going to make it a point to try to share a meal with someone who is far from God. And I'm going to begin with prayer and I'm going to really listen. What might happen? Begin with prayer. Listen to the needs of others. Eat with others. Third, serve others. Right? Serve others. Don't miss this. Pete and Mary's lives and the life of their family and the life of this church were changed because Sharon showed up and babysat their three little kids. 
And her willingness to show up and do that, to serve practically the needs of her neighbors, the needs of people that she loved, changed their lives, the life of their family, the life of this church. And Jesus said, I didn't show up to, to be served, but to, to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And I figure if that approach worked for Jesus, it just might work for us too. Begin with prayer. Listen to others, eat with others, serve others, and finally share your story. And I think that if we're actually living out the first four, that those opportunities for us to share come very naturally. And there's this old quip that sort of floats around that gets attributed to St. Francis that says, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words, right? I, there, there's something about that sentiment that I really love, right? Because it just points to the importance of trying to live in a way that bears witness. But there's a couple of things that I think are sort of misleading about it. First, St. Francis never said it. <laughs> there, there's no place in his extant writing that we actually have record that he, ever, that he ever actually said this. It sort of gets attributed to him in social media memes and things like that, or preacher stories. Um, the second thing, though, is I think it can be misleading in that for a person to really hear the message of the gospel and trust in Christ, how often is it necessary that they hear it in words? The answer is always. And so in some sense to say, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary use words is a bit like saying, feed the hungry at all times and when necessary use food, right? It's always necessary. But I think we sometimes make it more complicated than it has to be. John chapter nine, there's this incredible story of Jesus healing a man who was born blind. And the, the religious leaders are all kind of uh, in a tizzy about this. They bring the guy in, they start peppering him with questions, and there comes a point in the whole thing, he just goes, look, whether the guy's a sinner or not, I don't know. Here's what I know. I was blind, but now I see. And I believe all of us who are followers of Jesus have a story that fits that pattern. I was, but now. What was true of your life before you came to faith? And even, even those of us who maybe came to faith at a, a young age, in an early age, we still have a I was story. But what, what was it about hearing the gospel that drew you to trust and follow Jesus? And now, what's God doing in your life now? Every one of us, if we're followers of Jesus, have an I was but now story. Just a couple of weeks ago, I gathered together on retreat with all of our elders, and we each took an opportunity to share our I was but now story, and it was so powerful. And I think sometimes we overcomplicate sharing the gospel and feel like we need to memorize these formulas or get all the verses right and remember which Romans passage we flip to, and, and we sort of overcomplicate it when in reality, it's as simple as just sharing our story. I was but now. Friends, Jesus says to his disciples and through them to you and me, you will be my witnesses. The issue isn't will we or won't we, it's what kind of witnesses will we be? Will we be faithful witnesses? And I think what it looks like for us to be faithful witnesses is, is to be those people who show up into our ordinary lives, in our, in our homes, in our workplaces, our schools, our, our third places, that we show up there with a kind of missional intentionality, that we begin with prayer, God, open a door and help me to share, that we listen, that we really listen to the needs of other people, that we eat with people, we share tables with them, we serve people, meeting their practical needs, and then when the opportunity is there, we share our story. What does it mean to be formed in the way of Jesus for the sake of the world? It means beginning right where we are. It means loving people in a way that we could say, we loved you enough not only to share the gospel of God with you, but our lives as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us, your people. Even as we hear this beautiful story of your work in Pete and Mary's life, we rejoice in the ways in which you um, drew them to yourself through the love of these faithful disciples. And we're reminded, Lord, of our story. I was, but now. God, we pray that you'd help us to be people who take seriously your call 
to bear witness faithfully. In the midst of all the demands, all the busyness of our ordinary lives. Because, Lord, we recognize the truth and beauty of this good news that has changed us. And God, before we come to the table now, we just pause to do a moment of introspection, of self-reflection, to determine if there's anything that we need to name before you, to bring before you, before we come and, and partake of these elements that remind us of Christ's body, Christ's blood shed on our behalf, this good news that we wanna bring to the world. Begin now here with us. Father, we thank you for the truth that your word declares when it says, when we confess our sin, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for your grace that you lavish upon us in Christ Jesus. We celebrate that now as we partake of these elements. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.